please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Celebrating 16 years of Young Turks. Hello and welcome to Young Turks, India's longest running show on startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Shireen Bhan. On the show today, we put the spotlight on two sectors that have stood out in 2017. First, of course, payments continues to ride the wave that uh, we saw post-demonetization. We'll be speaking with Pradeep Nanu, co-founder and CEO of Instarem, a Singapore headquarter cross-border payments company. We'll also put the spotlight on agri-tech, a sector that's actually seen one of the highest number of new startup additions from Tier 2 and Tier 3 cities. So let's start with our focus on the agri-tech sector. Why does this matter to India? In a bid to double the average farmer's income by 2022, the government has launched an array of schemes to facilitate the market's growth and startups are leveraging this to focus on areas like increasing crop production, reduction in input prices for farmers and improving the overall supply chain. Of the 250-plus Indian agri-tech startups, 53 raked in. $313 million in funding last year, and investor interest in this segment continues to be strong. Shruti Mishra caught up with some of India's finest angel and early stage investors at the Let's Ignite conference in Mumbai, and here's a slice of that conversation on what's exciting them about investing in agri-tech and the challenges of being patient to yield the right returns. Take a look. Rajesh, you know, is agri-tech today uh, where the e-commerce industry was 10 years ago? Will it be bigger than e-commerce? I think certainly it can be. Even though globally we don't see uh, any unicorns coming out, but I think in next 10 years you will see massive new ag tech. I, let me reframe it. From farm to fork companies, okay. which will rethink, will disrupt on one side the food companies, the way mm -hmm. food companies, massive multinationals are structured today, from Unilever's to Nestle to ITC. And on the other side they will uh, rethink farming and everything in between. And all this in the next decade. Yes, decade's. so that's what our vision is. I think time is ripe now for next generation companies uh, to come in, rethink farm to fork. Yeah. So clearly there is a massive opportunity, uh, uh, both at the spend level, uh, at the impact it can create in the lives of millions. Patience is a key factor here. Investors need to be in the long haul. Do you feel that agri-tech is still a patient capital investment or is it poised for returns like other tech investments? When we say agri and agri-tech, they are relatively different. So the moment we say agri, everything that first hits everyone's mind is saying, uh, do we go and start cultivation? In cultivation, probably the growth is linear. So if you put a dollar, you'll probably get a $3 return, but that's, that's the return that you'll get because it's subjective to the yield that you get per hectare. But when you call, say, agri-tech, when you create a technology company which is intervening in agriculture, there your growth or the returns could be non-linear. So can you see a 10x, 20x, 30x return out there in an agri-tech business? Definitely. Have we seen this globally? That's already happening. Uh, in India, it's yet to advent. Uh, and more so, I think this is the right time for us to start uh, venturing into that sector. One of the biggest causes of post-harvest losses in India is the inadequate uh, cold chain infrastructure, while the production of high nutrition products like fruits, vegetables, meat and poultry have all gone up. What is lacking is the means to move and preserve and store these products. And there are big companies like ITC and Reliance who've entered the distribution space, but you know, yet there is much that needs to be done in terms of storage and logistics. Is this a big area of opportunity uh, for startups? Massive. I think that's where the in massive infrastructure needs to be built across the country. You know, and even bigger logistics company will get built bigger than some of the logistics companies we talk in e-commerce space. But how easy will it be for startups to enter this, right? You know, because we've only seen the bigger players come into this. Logistics, for example, you have Rivigo, which just yeah. turn the model using technology for efficiency and then using trucking trucks on loan, right? And there are a few marketplace models which are not successful, but Intercity is working in trucking. Yeah. That's the first stage where a technology driven, so they have taken technology as a first principle and then put trucking on top of it, right? So I think the models have to be inverted. See, ultimately, if you look at the, the common thing among this is a technology <coughs> disruption, right? So unless you can think of an angle where technology can really disrupt, which means an impact greater than 10x, that's why I call it technology can impact, is where you will start seeing this thing. Then the entire cold storage chain has to work for if fruit and vegetables have to work. 
so I think those things will come in. So sensors will come in, you know, uh, GPS data will come in. So I think, so there are two thin different opportunities. One is the core logistic companies, other is the core data companies. People who can collect data, analyze data, and can give you information in real time or near real time, and therefore you can act also very fast on it. Yes, Ajay, you wanted to add so something. The biggest challenge in agri sector today beyond production is actually distribution and logistics. Yeah. Uh, if you look at all the companies that you see, uh, especially the Logitech company out there, uh, they are all currently scratching the surface. So e-commerce logistics is the, I would say, the lowest hanging fruit. Uh, getting into agri is not difficult, right? But it's, it's just going deeper into the market where they have st still not started penetrating. Is that market lucrative enough? Yes. Uh, today, Rajesh would know it better or Manu would know it better than me. But farm to fork pricing is about 6x. So if you buy pomegranate at probably uh, at the farm's uh, sh uh, gate, you'll get it at about 10 bucks. If you buy it at the store, you'll get it at about 200 bucks. So uh, the variation is huge. Uh, can you disrupt that with uh, a marketplace model or with logistic and distribution channels? Yes, you can easily do it. Well, Agritech has long been underserved from a startup uh, perspective. For now, startups looking to enter into this space, what are the three big opportunities there? What should they be looking at? I think uh, one is clearly information arbitrage. Uh, there is a lot of work, digitization, stuff like that. There is huge asymmetry of information at various <laughs> levels. And I, it, it itself, it's a huge uh, uh, scale opportunity. In my view, second would be sharing economy. The sharing economy, which has uh, worked big in many other technology sectors, including transportation, I think in farming sector, there could be some interesting use cases to create multipliers. And finally, I think the, at the crop level, irrigation or aqua life, there is a lot of new technology and interventions which are not just uh, in the sense of information technology. Some of them have, may have to do with genetics. Some of it may have to do with biology. Yeah. All of that combined could create uh, a new world, in my view. All right, coming back to the investor side, what are the key macroeconomic movers that are showing the silver lining uh, for agri-tech investment? Why should angel investors and, you know, VCs bet big on this opportunity? So, so I invested in a tech company called Insta Aquatica through Let's Venture, actually. Yeah. So Shadhan invested. So, so the, he's trying to bring 10x impact in shrimp farming. So shrimp is a huge export from India, more than 3,000, 4,000 crores. Mm -hmm. And a lot of shrimp got wastage because the way technology is and, and the efficiency was very low. So ex guy from Accenture, he went to the villages up Karnataka and, and, and those regions and, and Andhra Pradesh, and he sat together two years R&D money just to develop a, a apparatus which, is, which can look at the fresh water and, and do whatever <coughs> magic he does with the hardware, and he's got a 10x impact. So wow. which means now he's selling to the farmers, which is equipment cost about two crore rupees, mm. and that's going to be a big thing. Yeah. So, so I think those kind of uh, belief has to be there that people will do that kind of work. But they required for him to be on the field, test his equipment, you know, put things together and, and create this 10x efficiency in the system. I think it's important is to engine investors to develop an understanding of the sector. Yeah. And not just investors because somebody's coming with a pitch by changing the changing the cover page. So how do you kind of evaluate start agri-tech startups? You know, when you come in come in to invest uh, in them, what do you look for? What should these angels be looking for? So my first criteria would be to understand how deep this person has gone in understanding the sector itself. Second I will evaluate is how deep technical that person can be as a matter of habit. As I told you, you have to literally read the research paper. For example, if you go to an IIC Institute of Science in Bangalore, hmm. if you speak to a professor, he will tell you, okay, why a one meter down moisture is different and what technology is used, you know, I'm measuring days now. So he'll tell you how the curves move. So really everyone really understand. It's like what Elon Musk do to a large extent, right? He takes the yeah. field, do the research paper and understand where things are going. So I would look for a lot of you know, understanding of other, are they going in depth of technology or, or not. So, you know, Rajesh, you've launched a gastrotope. What, have, what did you look for those in these startups? How are you incu uh, incubating them, especially, you know, from farm to fork? How are you kind of doing that? So we are very early stage, unlike VC. So, uh, uh, idea is how innovative they are. Uh, uh, how, what is the technology quotient? Uh, what is the entrepreneurial motivation? Where is it coming from? Uh, some of those things, and then of course we look at uh, the impact on how big the market could be, because it's all in the realm of imagination, right? Yeah. It's not about, we are not looking for startups which improve the productivity by 10% or 
I am looking for startups who change the things 1,000 percent. They, they create a new way of doing things. And that's the idea of incubating those experiments. They may work, they may not work. If they don't work, start again, do something else. Right. That's our goal there. Before I let you all go, one final question for all of you. What will it take to have our first agri-unicorn uh, from India? And do you really see it happening? In my personal opinion, I think uh, a unicorn in agri-tech would be much easier to create as compared to most of the other e-commerce companies that we have seen. And it's, it's purely from a VC perspective, looking at the numbers uh, in, in the sector. So the repeat rates are very high. The ticket sizes are big. Uh, any, any marketplace which gets created out here, uh, unlike a Snapdeal or Flipkart, uh, the numbers out here would pan so big, so huge, and the market itself is immense. So I, I think from purely the numbers perspective, building a unicorn in agri-tech is much easier uh, as compared to building one in retail. I think as an entrepreneur, my focus is to create value. I think the clear value is where the impact can come. If you can get 10x more than impact in productivity or getting mm. more price or information sharing, I think Unicorn will happen because opportunity is, is huge. Yeah. Our GDP is 50% is the agri economy, right? So and by when do you, do you see that happening? I think it'll take five years realistically to create something of great value. All right, that's not far. Okay, Mukesh, your thoughts on this? Yeah. I think I would you know, agree with Manav. So basically what's really happening is there are systemic inefficiencies that is there, which I think slowly is falling in place. I mean, things are getting corrected. So once, if you take a look at the amount of inefficiency that is there and the size of the opportunity, realistically it will happen. When? Very hard to predict. All right, so everybody agrees it will happen. Rajesh, your thoughts on this? I think in last 10 years, India has produced 10 unicorns. I think in next 10 years, we'll have 10 ectech unicorns. Okay. I think the massive, there's a massive opportunity. They will be different from what we can imagine. Hmm. Uh, doing, solving so many different aspects. A lot of challenges. Yeah. Uh, unicorn is an idea that VCs have created because yeah. based on funding and all of that. Uh, but I think what is more uh, important is to create large scale impact companies, right? Which, which change the game, which change the consumer behavior, which change, create new paradigm of doing business. I, I clearly see 10, 15 such companies easily emerging in India. As per the NASCOM Startup Report of 2017, fintech and payments continue to be one of the sectors that saw the maximum number of new startup additions as well as the flow of venture capital. The startup in focus on the show today is Singapore-based Instagram. It's a cross-border payments company which in November received the regulatory approval from the Reserve Bank of India to facilitate overseas remittances from India. But that's not Instagram's only India Connect. It's India-born and bred founder Prajit Nanu has an interesting startup story. Shruti Mishra discovered this in her conversation with him. Take a look. It's a very funny story. Uh, sending money out of India is extremely difficult. And I was trying to book a villa for a friend's bachelor party. Yeah. And uh, it was a, such a difficult process. So I called up my bank and they sent so much forms to me saying, hey, can you fill this? Can you fill this? Can you fill that? And I said, no, I don't want to fill that much. And it was a small amount of money, like about 30,000 rupees. So I said, uh, you know, out of sheer frustration, I updated uh, social media to see what can be done and has anyone done anything. A friend of mine reached out. He said, listen, I'm in Thailand right now. Okay. And I can send the money locally and you give me money into my local account and let's just square it off and uh, no fees, nothing for us. I said, fantastic, right? We did that, money reached the guy the same day and everything was beautiful. And then I, I think it was the worst holiday I've ever had because <laughs> can, you can imagine, right? You go on a holiday party and last thing you want to sit in a room and think that, can we take this concept and scale it? What sets you apart from the other remittances companies in the world? So what happens today? Uh, if you ever walk into a bank, you'll see a bank rate or a FX rate. That's not what you see on economic times. Yeah. It's very different, that's very high. And you wonder like, what is this? Like this is not. So what we've done is that we provide significant transparency when it comes to FX. We'll give you the exact mid-market rate at what banks kind of transact at, and we charge you a percentage of the amount. Okay. So globally, World Bank says that uh, the average cost of a payment is 8.5%. Hmm. What Instagram charges is 0.5%, that's wow. it. Yeah, so that's incredibly low. Yeah. Second is speed. 
speed speed we've made payments much faster we do 24 by 7 payments you can send a payment from australia to india within few minutes now you charge less than banks and traditional remittances services how do you make money what is your revenue model so i think uh, the most important thing is our transparency so we charge you half a percent of the amount you're sending that's it okay. so if there's any thousand dollars your fee is five dollars that's it no other fee no hidden fee mm -hmm. how we make money so look, let's look at any of our competitors who are brick and mortar so you actually go and give money to an agent he takes the money he gives you a code then that money is uh, uh, through electronically is transmitted to somebody else say in india who also has a code basically you go and give the code to that guy and he'll give out the money so you see there are various agents during the whole network and in our case we don't have any net networks or any agents etc i collect the money from you from a bank and i deposit the money into a bank account of your choice so basically i have removed the whole agent network as part of a business and that's why our costs are really low uh, we make decent enough margins to make this a real business. So it's not a business where we are uh, kind of breaking a bank to kind of make a transaction. What are the trends that you're seeing that are driving foreign remittances business in India? Yeah, I think uh, most important thing is internet's completely connected the world, right? So today an Australian company will have a social media managed out of India, right? And he has to be paid. Yeah. Now that whole payment is done through our platform. That makes us very happy. We've got a lot of uh, people who run uh, various kinds of technology setups, uh, social media, hmm. uh, people People have offshore subsidiaries, they are paying their payroll, uh, consultants, uh, social media consultants. So if you, you can be a freelancer who wants to get paid, you can be paid via our platform. So these are some of the trends which are actually driving business payments into India. Mm. And I think it's been very interesting to see that uh, before us it used to cost 4 to 6 percent to take money out and convert it. And now we are doing it at a half a percent fee. Now Instagram has raised over 18 million dollars till date. Take us through your investors, partners and how have they helped you scale up? We raised half a million dollars uh, from uh, Rocket Internet when we were two guys on a PowerPoint. They were the only guys, believe me, they were the only guys who were ready to cut a check. We were two guys, both with about 15 years of experience, both had done well in corporate careers. We went to a lot of VCs and they said, uh, no, I think it's too early, we don't like the business, or larger players will kill you. But Rocket Internet came in, within two weeks we had the money. And that kind of gave us the massive surge. And since then, we've raised money from Vertex Ventures, which is the venture capital arm of Tamasek. Uh, Tamasek is Singapore government's investment arm. Uh, Vertex brings a lot of stability. Uh, in fact, even today, if I have anything to, uh, if, if I have a question in terms of should, what path should I follow, I would actually go to them and say that, is this the right path to follow, etc. So they add a lot of value to the business in terms of network connections and helping us raise follow-on rounds. Uh, we've got uh, Fullerton Financial Holding, which is another uh, subsidiary of Tamasek, and uh, Rocket Internet, of course, came in. Now, you recently raised $13 million in funding. What do you plan to do with the investments? I think uh, largely the investments will go in helping us build our business. Mm. Our business currently, I would still say we are very small on from a global perspective. But now we've read the scale in terms of licensing. Now what happens is that now we are going to invest money in Europe to basically build our brand, to build our consumer business. Uh, we're going to uh, invest money in the US. One of the interesting businesses which we have is uh, banks today at the back end use Instagram to make payouts. Okay. So banks instead of competing with us, I think we've formulated a great story where they use us at the back end. And they're partnering with you? They are partnering. And so uh, that re business requires a lot of money because the, we have a massive risk appetite in that business to kind of drive volumes, etc. Are you profitable today? We are transactional profitable. So what I mean, what I mean by that is, uh, I'm, every transaction I do is profitable. But what we need is scale because we've uh, built offices in multiple markets, and once we hit a scale, we'll hit profitability. So we are looking at profitability Q4 of next year. How many customers do you have globally, and what is your average transaction size? We have about hundred thousand customers and our average transaction size is about $2,000. Now the interesting part of our average transaction size is much higher than competitors. So we majorly have uh, white collar customers who are sending large ticket payments, uh, coming back, family maintenance, etc. So that's the primary transactions what we do. You also work with SMEs. What percentage of your customer do they constitute? So today they are about 20%, but honestly we are trying to push that more and more. And I'll tell you why. Uh, consumer, which is the individual business, uh, most of the money services business, online digital players like us, have a large share of the chunk. So bank is a smaller share. But when it comes to SMEs, 90% uh, of the book is still with banks. So that business is something which we are really pushing harder for. Hmm. But uh, you know the problem with the SME is that they trust the bank a bit too much. And then they don't really want to kind of work with players like us. But that change is happening. We're seeing that change happen, but we need to really push that change much faster. Between now and 2020, what are the major trends that you see across cross-borders? I think one thing you'll see is a lot of use of blockchain. 
So blockchain is emerging as a technology which will help us reduce the cost even further and simplify the whole process even more. My final question to you, what are the future plans? What are the kind of volumes that you're targeting? And also, are you eyeing a public listing? Uh, by 2020, we intend to list publicly. I think we are, uh, so next year we plan to break even and gives us about a 12 to 24 month window to actually plan for an IPO. Exit. Yeah. If you really look at fintechs like us, right, uh, there are not many who have actually gone in IPOs. Well, that's pretty quick. You started in 2014 and 2020, you're eyeing a listing. Correct. I think it's, uh, from our perspective, I think it's a way we're giving it back to our investors as well. And as well as we strongly believe the model is sustainable and long term. So it's not a short term model which will basically kind of impact and it does not have the right margins, etc. Uh, right now, our focus is all about scaling. It's all about getting markets running, really differentiating our proposition. We have a large Indian community who uses us every month on month to send. We've got an active customer base. I have customers who write emails to me saying that, hey, do you can you build a new feature which will do this for me? So that's a great engagement we have. Now, how do you take that, scale it, add new markets, bring new banks to the platform? So that's the next uh, 24 months for us. But it'll be a great ride. Uh, looking forward for it. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Young Turks. Tell us what you thought of our show. Write into us, youngturks at nw18.com. That's our email address. You can also tune in to our Facebook and Twitter feed for news and updates. Till next week, from all of us here, goodbye and many thanks for watching. Celebrating 16 years of Young Turks.